Thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of the Ono oh Disc Golf Podcast. We are on episode 88 with my co-host Kyle and special guest of the night, Nova Polite. I feel I like I pronounced that wrong again. No, you got it right. <laughs> okay, uh, for people who don't know Nova, she is the two-time FP50 world champion, the most winningest FPO player in the state of Kansas, and possibly, this is just this hasn't been tested yet, the tallest FPO disc golfer in the world. So, uh, welcome Nova, thank you for joining us. Oh, glad to be here. Those are... Those are weird and obscure statistics. Um, yeah, <laughs> Some was, of them uh, are. <laughs> yeah, the, the most winningest in the state of Kansas. That's like some deep cut stat mando shit. That's it's like it's like finding out the linebackers got like the most sacks on Thursday nights in the NFC North. It's like where where do these <laughs> statistics come from? Yeah, I always like those because it's like uh, everyone can be a record holder at that point, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so every, Everybody's the most special now. In the state of Kansas is pretty cool, though. Like that's uh, that's I, I would hold that in high regard because Kansas is known for disc golf too. It's not like it's some state that doesn't have a decent amount of disc golf. While that is true, it it's like everybody comes to Kansas to play disc golf, but nobody like lives in Kansas to play disc golf. Uh, yeah, I don't right. even I don't even live in Kansas. I'm like right across the border in Missouri. Um, uh, I live near Kansas City and the metro splits the two sides of the, the state line. Right. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, so when I play in local tournaments, half of them are in Missouri, half of them are in Kansas. So I interesting. And there's not a lot of FPO action out here in the Great Plains. So I just tend to rack up easy wins that they don't count for anything. Well, so uh, would we be able to say that you might be the most winningest in Missouri as well? What are, you, what are the chances that that's? That's a state um, stat. I don't know. That that seems less likely because Missouri okay. is, well, it's got Cynthia Ricciotti, whose home base is okay. Columbia, Missouri. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there are some, a lot of OG FPO players from the St. Louis Metro over on the other side okay. of the state. So I don't know. We'll have to ask Stat Mando. Right. We'll look for it. We'll look on Twitter for that. All right. <laughs> Eric's the numbers guy of the show. <laughs> cool <laughs> uh so other than uh, some of the obscure facts why don't you tell us in the audience just a little oh. bit about yourself okay well let's see i'm yeah i'm the 2x defending fp50 world champion which means i'm over 50 years old um turning 53 this year um started playing disc golf in the spring of 2015 uh went pro by the end of that year and never looked back and uh, prior to that, I'd been a lifelong athlete, um, changing sports probably every three or four years. So I'm, I'm not like super physical. I'm not, I'm not like, like some kind of crazy buff athlete or anything. It's just doing things was always really fun to me. And I was encouraged into it even from early childhood, uh, partly because of the way I was raised. And so I, uh, I never saw any reason to stop. And legit, it kind of solves the problem of how do you make friends as an adult? Because making friends as an adult is a real pain, but being out and doing things, well, you can make friends with the people you're playing with. So, so boom, yeah. there it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's how I found a lot of my friends here. Um, being a transplant from Michigan, it was so difficult to uh, find people, especially during the pandemic, it was... Uh, almost but impossible yeah so, it's a double uh, whammy yeah it was a little bit rough but i found a wonderful community within the disc golf uh place but uh that uh what what was uh another sport that you really enjoyed uh besides disc golf but like with that you had played before oh uh, the big one i'd say was probably fencing i did that in college um awesome. and because i was in college for about 11 years i fenced for a long time <laughs> but so you're, was... do- so you're a doctor <laughs> no <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> no i was uh i was dealing with some things so i you're, left you're totally I, okay i left school and came back a couple of times and when i say left school i mean they threw me out 
Uh, but <laughs> school and I were on a, you know, school and I were on a little bit of a break. Let's put it that oh, way. Yeah. And then I went and worked in a factory full time. And I was like, you know what? I think I'd rather be back in school. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Factories are not fun work. It's not fun work. No. Yeah. Mm -mm. It makes you rethink your career choices real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Get you a computer job. Don't, don't be in manufacturing. Right. Uh, But that's cool. Fencing. I have never, I don't, I have no concept of fencing. Well, I'll tell you what, first off, it's, it's not what you think. You think like, you know, just Ponzi la 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 waving the little foil around. No, no. Fencing, fencing is brutal. There is no part of your body that is not exhausted after a a fencing match or a fencing workout, because you are using every muscle you got from your toes all the way up to the end of your fingers. And uh, you're like, you're doing all of it in like these crazy deep, deep thigh squats and deep hip squats, you know, very low to the ground, feet spread out, Uh running, running back and forth. It always looked like dancing to me. Well, that's the beauty of it. That's the footwork. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Because, you know, I mean, you're both equipped with a sword that is the same length. So if you want to hit somebody or if you want to poke them and you don't want them to poke you, you got to really focus on the distance between you. And then very subtly on the sly, like, maybe just move your feet a little bit and suddenly right. you're close enough and then pow, you touch them. Oh, and, uh, but, uh, but you know, it's not just, you don't just shuffle forward and back with your feet always apart. Mm-hmm. You know, you do basically what's the next step. You do right. like this. Exactly. You that's do this, this crossing, not- you do this crossover step forward and back. And I, I, I like when I was first starting disc golf, I watched a video on the X step and I was just like, I can do that. Right, like you've done that before. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, cool, I'm there. Yeah, million times. That's so interesting. Cross training from fencing, because well, I've 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 I'm into uh, I have a couple friends that are into teaching disc golf as well. Okay. So they're always always kind of like reexamining how how some people are just so naturally it, mm-hmm. everything just clicks and everything some people it's like three years and they still don't look even that good that that person just picked up a random disc but um yeah there's a lot of that like uh uh one-handed backhand swing in tennis is right. the backhand throw in disc golf mm-hmm. and then the baseball sidearm throw is uh the flick right but so is, you could you can bring all the sport you can bring all the sports to disc amazing. golf yeah, fencing is more about the footwork, really. Sorry, that that's a great tangent. <laughs> I love that. We could do that for an hour. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, Eric, you on on track? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> sorry. On to, yeah. After all that, let's go on to question two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what, you've, been, you've been playing in disc golf or competing in disc golf for going on eight years now uh why don't you tell Uh, us a little bit about how or this will be the eighth year i guess um why don't you tell us a little bit about how the atmosphere surrounding the game has changed um in those eight years okay well yeah yeah well i'd say for about the first five and a half to six it was just super chill um Mm -hmm. what you know whatever most people believe about disc golf being just laid back and accepting and everybody can be their own kind of weird and everybody's just chill on the course and everybody's cool. I'd say for about the first five and a half, six years, absolutely a hundred percent spot on. That was totally the experience. And then like in about the last year and a half, uh, this culture war thing around people being trans just got turbocharged Mm -hmm. and that's, kind of changed the atmosphere a little bit. It was really weird because I, uh, you know, a little bit of background. Um, I transitioned uh, 20 to 23 years ago, depending on how you want to measure when it starts or stops. And Mm -hmm. so around 2015, when I came to play disc golf, you know, I'd been living in this gender for like a decade and a half. So at that point, I was just like, you know, I signed up for the PDG, I checked F on the box. And then, but before I entered a tournament, I went online and looked at their documents and I was like, what do they think about that? And it was just like, yeah, if you're post-surgery, you're cool. 
So I was like, well, if that's their rule, I'm not even going to tell them why, you know, you know, I, I'm abiding by the rules. So whatever, right. if they don't ask why, why bother? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and I was not living openly trans at the time because uh, legitimately I was just kind of sick of people shit. Um, yeah, right. and, you don't, and you don't even have to explain it really. You just, yeah. 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 That's yeah. Your decision. Yeah. Just yeah. Like, Cause like, yeah, I mean, obviously, during the the process of transition from 2000 to 2003, everybody knew because you can't. You, there's no hiding yeah. that shit, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one day your name is this, the next day your name is that, and then you grow tits. Everyone's going to be like, "Hey, it's like, hey, hey, something's up. something's something changed here." I yeah, can't put my finger out it. <laughs> are, yeah, are you wearing your hair differently? You know, <laughs> but uh, but after uh, after. Once I was done with everything, I was just like really tired of like having to justify myself everywhere. I went all the time. So I was just like, I'm just going to like stop talking about it and stop bringing it up and just sort of drift away. And that's where I was in 2015 when I joined the sport. So I checked off on the on the form when I signed up to play disc golf. I knew I was cool by the rules as they existed at the time. So I just started playing in women's divisions and nobody, not a soul said boo about it like mm-hmm. for six years. I mean, there was this one dude in the local club who's there's always one right yeah he's kind of a hater and he, he like <laughs> got a hold of some documents he should not have been legally allowed to get a hold of and doxed me to like everybody behind my back oh no but but like nobody came and told me about it so i literally don't know if that had any effect on anything at all because right. if you meet somebody for the first time and they're kind of a butthole to you is it because they didn't like your face or maybe they're just a butthole themselves or maybe they're having a bad day or, you know, maybe somebody yelled at them on the drive over and now they're road raging. Right. Mm-hmm. Or somebody doxed you and, you know, told all of your old life info to them and they're totally against that. I, I'm not a telepath. So if I just meet somebody for the first time and they're like, rah, 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 you know, I, I don't know why they're doing that. So I can't assume it's because they're a hater. Right. You know? mm-hmm. So I, you know, maybe, maybe that happened a couple of times in the first six years. Maybe it didn't. I literally have no way, epistemologically speaking, to say for sure. So right. I'm just, I'm just going to call that a big no. But, but the whole time I'd been playing disc golf, those first six years were just like some kind of ideal experience, uh, utterly mind blowing. I made more friends and better friends and longer lasting friends in the first six years of playing disc golf than I had in like the first 30, 40 years of my life combined. Right. And, That's amazing. And, you know, and, and, you know, making adults is making friends as an adult is hard. So the quality and quantity of good and enduring friends I was making was really blowing my mind in a good way. So I was a huge supporter of the social scene in disc golf. And then the way it's changed in the last year and a half, it's just like, I don't know, man, it's like the floor dropping out or like that sudden cold wind of betrayal that suddenly blows through you. It's like, whoa, what is happening here? So, yeah. yeah. The, and, and it's like if the PDGA like grew boobs or something, you'd be like, something's different here. Your poli- <laughs> didn't you, did you change your policies? Did you, did something? No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sorry. and you know, it, and the new policy wasn't the beginning of it. It goes back farther um, because, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there, there have been other openly transgender players, um, Kelly Jenkins over on the East coast um, for just as one example. And nobody really much cared about the trans issue for years and years and years and and then one day one of us started winning really big and i'm not her um <laughs> you know back to back said fp50 is not winning big i am so sorry um no, it is though <laughs> yeah, yeah but nobody gives a shit about masters um but over on the over on the dgpt side um there there was this big win and suddenly people were finding out that their tolerance for transgender women didn't go as far as they thought it did, or they weren't as good at allies as they might've imagined they were because, you know, it's like, yeah, cool. You can play with us. And then one of us wins and they're like, oh wait, but not like that. 
Yeah, we didn't want you to win. <laughs> and it's Wait, like, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, and, you know, so there's like a little bit of backlash uh, against, you know, Notch and the W when I guess we weren't supposed to. And there is also just this external culture war that's been ramped up in the last couple of years. And we could do a two hour show just about that. Yeah. That's but uh, yeah, but I'm going to slow down and let y'all talk a little. No, <laughs> we're here to listen. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, I don't know, two, you know, cis, male, gender, white. We don't scream discrimination uh, as, you know, we haven't really experienced it. So, as, mm. I, like, for me in particular, I, I, I don't, there's no way I can understand uh, what it even feels like. So, um, no, we need to, we need to listen. And I feel like this is really important for our listeners as well to kind of like, you're, you're not a fucking scary monster. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that's like the fucking mindset right now <laughs> is that you're not a fucking person. You're like a fucking monster. It's like, fuck that noise. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, no, just, wanted, well, just had to establish that real quick. Oh no. Cause no, that's actually a really good point because like I look at like some of the terminally online stuff that is going around like on uh, on Facebook. I, I do keep an eye on what my enemies are up to because I want to know the state of the discourse or at what angle they're going to be coming at me next. Absolutely. And it's really ridiculous because it's not just they're not just like sitting there like a bunch of serious colonels at a war room table like strategery you know like how are we going to attack this issue and what's the best strategy you know they're just they're just memeing at each other you know they're right. sharing posts and they're they're pointing and laughing but the thing of it is when they try to make fun of me behind my back in their spaces it's like they're not really making fun of me because they'll like say shit about me that ain't true right. or or, you know, or they'll exaggerate things or they'll take stuff out of context. So it's like they're building up this weird and, you know, de deformed scarecrow. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. they hang a sign around the scarecrow's neck. It's like Nova P. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they light it on fire and they dance around it in a circle and they laugh and they point. And, and it's like, yeah, but you, you all realize that's not me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't even be mad because it's like, you know, if they were like coming at me and making fun of me where I am for my actual shortcomings, well, then we'd have to, I, you know, there'd be time to reflect and talk about it. But right. they're like, but they're off on the it's weirdest. Made up bullshit. And it's, yeah. And it's, so it's like, I'm just like a spectator. I'm just kind of sitting off at the side. Like, <laughs> what are they, what are they doing? How do you, who raised these fucking people? Uh, and, and how do you, well, more to the point, I feel sad for them because it's like, think about it. What is, what is it like to live a life where it's a normal everyday thing to like make fun of a minority for being a minority? And, you know, what, what is your brain? What is your personality? And, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum. If that's like a thing you do that shapes your personality and it shapes your outlook on life, but it also literally shapes your thoughts. And it's like, I feel like they're living in some kind of mental jail or they're living in a smaller world where the horizon- Alternate reality, yeah. Yeah, they're living in a world where the horizon is only 20 feet away. And there's no wonder in their world because everything is nearby and closed off. And then everything outside it is weird and scary and this, like, let's make fun of it. Right. And there's a lot of really interesting ways to be. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff in this world. But if you just fear everything that's outside that 20 foot horizon and just make fun of it, then you're closing yourself off from the potential of knowing some incredible stuff or meeting some amazing people. And I just feel sad for them. Um, I, I can't even hate them back. It wouldn't be right. It'd be like, it'd be like punching down, which <laughs> right. I, real, I realize that's the tables are turned, but, but and, there and it like, is. As much as they deserve it, it's like, um, I, we, I feel like me, uh, 
I feel the same way. I, I, I don't think in a hateful way. It just doesn't come to my brain. Um, right. So um, the idea that somebody just like lives within that is uh, really difficult it's, for me to even process. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just kind of depressing because right. it represents a loss of human potential. You know, um, you know, each of us in aggregate or each of us individually can contr contribute to humanity in the whole. And then some people, for whatever reason, just aren't bringing a lot. And I don't know, I feel like something happens to these people, something, something about the way they're raised or the culture, or I don't, something makes a person this way and then we don't get their full potential. We get what we get. And I feel like if we could find a way to not make people end up this way, we'd have more better people. Yeah, you're so right. <laughs> oh. Okay, so how did the PDGA mm -hmm. go from this? Because I had the same same idea. It's it's this wonderful, inclusive community where you can be yourself. Uh, Eric and I used to skateboard. Uh, so we both transitioned into disc golf and that became like our, our main uh, thing. And we really communicated well through that and um, have made a wonderful community around our, both of us have done that uh, through disc golf. And it, it makes me wildly uncomfortable to even now participate in a PD, like that type of thing, because like, I don't want to, uh, like show any type of like approval for that type of discriminatory behavior. Um, so maybe, uh, sorry, that was a totally long winded question, but, um, cool. uh, like when, when did you think it started? Like not like what, what, what happened? Can you, can you just like let, a, let the uh, people know? I legitimately don't know. Um, because you know, it, it took me by surprise. It took, I think it took a lot of people of goodwill by surprise, uh, this policy change. And I feel like for the longest time, and I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, I feel like for the longest time, disc golf was just in a very live and let live kind of way. And so it's easy to do the right thing when it's easy. So, you know, uh, there was no culture war going on. So uh, transgender women weren't some kind of predator to be defended against. And transgender women were racking up elite series wins. That so I, I forgot that slipped my mind. Yeah, that, that too. So, so it was very easy to, it was very easy to just be live and let live because there were no challenges in the space, but... Mm -hmm. And I think it made it really easy for people to get complacent and feel like disc golf was actively positive when in fact, what I think it was, was more of sort of a indifferent and just going along with the flow. Um, because human beings, um, behaviorally speaking, we tend to follow the path of least resistance. Um, and you can, but if you try to imagine that, imagine walking alongside uh, a steep mountainside. And if you're not, if you don't pay attention to where you're going, you'll just tend to drift downward. And next thing you know, you're down in the valley. And mm -hmm. the same thing with behavior, whatever is sort of the easiest thing to do, that's what people generally tend to do. Um, and this gets into, this, this gets people and it gets group, groups of people into trouble because frequently doing the right thing is hard. And the path of least resistance is the other way. And so for a long time, the path of least resistance was just to go along with the status quo because there weren't any challenges. Transgender people playing, sure, whatever. Don't even think about it, not a problem. And then you've got the external pressure of this culture war and it doesn't, it can't stay external because, you know, when people, think a thing and when they feel it and when they believe it, it's with them all the time. 
you know, people, people don't go onto the disc golf course and be one kind of human and then go over to a political rally and be a different kind of person. Right. Whoever, whoever they are goes with them 24 seven. Yeah. So attitudes were changing and transphobia was being whipped up in the broader culture. So right. of course it was going to be on the increase in disc golf as well. And then suddenly, suddenly there was a problem to be solved. Um, I mean, spoilers, no, there wasn't, but that was the perception. And, and suddenly having transgender women doing well was a problem. Spoilers, no, it isn't, but, <laughs> and then we have what we perceive as being a positive and supportive organization that had actually just been coasting along doing it the easy way is mm -hmm. actually faced with a difficult decision of how do we how do we do policy how do we do what's right how do we do what's fair and it comes up and it runs up against a board of directors that is not stacked in favor of inclusion and against a pdga that frankly as an organization is not a well-oiled machine and i'm gonna sound like one of those old b cranks who's been in disc golf for like 20 years because it's like everybody that's been in disc golf for 20 years has some kind of fuck the PDGA story. And, right. and I know because as soon as I started getting at disc golf, they all came to tell me, um, which I don't know, weird is like, there's this phenomenon. I'm just like, yeah, I'm starting to get pretty good at disc golf. Randy's getting up there and notching a couple of wins. And then all these really old guys start coming to me to tell me how terrible the PDJ is. And I'm like, dude, who are you? What is happening? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> And I don't want to. I don't want to turn into one of those. So, that's that's not where I'm going with this. But it's. But I, I did some looking, and it's like, yeah, as nonprofits go, the PDGA is not as agile as a better structured organization could be, and mm -hmm. and I think that's because the sport has grown exponentially in the last couple of years, and right. yet and the organization hasn't grown with it. Well, and the organization was built on an ethos of volunteerism and sort of a low intensity level of effort. And suddenly things need to be really structured and very professional. And I think there's some whiplash here because the organization hasn't caught up to the demands of the modern social environment and the number of people who are involved in disc golf as well as just sort of the turbocharging of everything that terminally online social media people can create. Because, mm -hmm. you know, ideas come up, spread virally, get shared around as memes, and, you know, way faster than the PDGA can even react. Right. So I don't think the PDGA was ready for the trans issue. And I'm let down and disappointed, but in the end, not super surprised that they fumbled the ball. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, it sucks that they showed their true colors so clearly, but also like now, you know, fucking what they're thinking at least, I guess. Well, and, and not, not the whole board, you know, I'd like to point out uh, from the, you know, in November when they voted on this policy, it was a four-three split. Okay. Yeah this this was this was not a slam dunk issue. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much the president of the board sets the agenda, but I know the president of the PDGA is definitely not an LGBT ally. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we could, you know, maybe in the edit, we can put up some of those uh, screenshots from Facebook. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, one thing too. I, I just remembered, sorry. Um, I loved on your, uh, I don't know if it was your most recent video or your second most recent video hmm. that um, this it's, yes, it's a big deal, but you've been experiencing discrimination discrimination for a very long time 
This mm. is not anything new and you will be just fine. But it, it does suck and you weren't expecting it. So it's like, I thought you guys were kind of, you know, we're on the same, yeah. team, or, you know, we thought we were friends here. What the fuck? Like, um, right. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I, I had grown pretty accustomed to institutions of all sorts, just sort of letting me down again and again. And I got a little complacent myself. I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there. I thought disc golf was going to be better than this. So I kind of set myself up for a fall on this one. I'm, I'm right there with you. I was so surprised. Um, it, it was just, I, yeah, to come down on the side of discrimination is just like insane to me um, as an organization. Like, yeah. What the fuck? Um, right. And, and the weird thing is, like, if you go back to uh, their announcement post and then like the policy post and read what they wrote, it's like, you know, there's a paragraph of introduction and then there's three or four paragraphs of why we're going to do the horrible thing we're about to do. And then the last paragraph is like this self-congratulatory back padding disclaimer kind of paragraph where they they try to reel it back in but not really where they're like oh but that aside we'd like to remind you that the pdga does not support discrimination you know for sex or gender or disability status or veteran status or age or you know all the various classes in any way not that bad. So, yeah, like... <laughs> so we are totally on your side and also get out you know, it's like, oh, come on. <laughs> it's like, pick one. It's like you, so, were, you were so close. You were so close. <laughs> you were so close to getting it. It's like, we abhor discrimination. Well, you can't put a statement like that at the end of a discriminatory policy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's like running naked down the street, waving a washcloth in front of your genitals going, you can't, no, no, don't look at that. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm so sorry. You're still streaking. You know, <laughs> you know, you're running full tilt. The wind's blowing. That that little washcloth ain't doing the trick. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can see everything. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Oh. Uh, so, do you quickly want to just touch on how the policy has affected you and your um, competing ability to compete? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I I recently ran the gauntlet of medical tests to get back into the PDJ's good graces as a part-time female. So, well, sorry, didn't mean to kill you there. Um, oh, it's just so <laughs> fucked. <God. laughs> Thank you. But uh, you're not fucking a person now, not a person now. It's like, fuck that noise. Sorry. Sorry, I just yeah. had, to, had to go ahead. I can, yeah. I can say that for you. No, it's cool. It's like I should be doing that cabaret act where, where the person is like female on one side and male on the other, depending <laughs> yeah. on which way they're facing. Yeah. You know, but uh, uh, it's uh, in practical terms, I'm kicked off the tour. Um, I am not eligible to compete in any DGPT event, and that includes the Silver Series. Um, and the reason for that is even though I completed transition 20 years ago, and even though I've successfully passed a blood test, in fact, it's at the floor of the normal, uh, excuse me, the typical female range. Um, mm -hmm. Because I did not have the good sense to begin my transition when I was around 12 years old in 1982, I am permanently barred from competing in DGPT, uh, DGPT Silver Series, and FPO majors, um, which oddly opens this weird loophole because basically I can play FPO at C tiers, B tiers, A tiers, and right. I can play FP40, FP50 at any tier. So, you know, Pro Masters Worlds, FP50, yeah, I'm in. Um, okay. But, but, so, but yeah, but, and the, the real, the, the shame of that is, first off, being, being banned from any tournament sucks, but, uh -huh. Being banned from the DGPT hurts especially badly because I was placing in the bottom third because I'm not actually that good at disc golf. So I was bringing money and throwing it into the pot and donating it to the kids. You know, mm -hmm. the, the FPO yeah. players who are 18, 20, 30, um, e even, you know, even 40, you know, 
they were you know, like Owen Scoggins or uh, yeah. Sarah, Sarah Hokum coming up here real soon. Um, right. mm -hmm. You know, you know, you know, these are all players who are getting in the cash and the cash they're getting in is my cash. I'm bringing the cash and giving it to them. And, <laughs> yeah. and all I'm getting it out of it is, you know, maybe a one in a thousand chance of being on video if I do something amazing or the chance to play disc golf with the best at at the nearby events you know when the when the traveling circus when the tour comes within a 500 mile radius of my home i hop on and as they're disappearing across the horizon i hop back off because i don't go that far but yeah. uh, i'm losing the chance to compete in these elite series events and test my skills against the best and you know if a tip-top touring pro has a bad day and i have a fire day they might only beat me by one or two and that feels pretty good. Um, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> but also the way, the way the tournaments are run, I mean, all credit to the DGPT, terrible thing that they just did aside, they run a tight show. The tournaments are top notch. The, the environment for the players is astonishing. It is the best experience I have playing disc golf is playing at these tournaments. And now I, I don't get to play. I can't, I can't come play. I can't have this experience. I can't donate money to the better pros. And mm -hmm. that's, it's got me gutted. That's your community. Um, that's, uh, well, that's it your is, friends. That's, it is. And because like, they tour and because they tour, you know, they don't live near me. They're not, they're not my homies from, you know, Bartlett park, you know, two miles away. Um, yeah. I only see them at these tournaments and, you know, so now I'm basically not going to see them. that is uh, uh, one of the ways the policy changes affected me there's others <laughs> absolutely fucked i'm so sorry that you have to go through this i have to say that one time i shouldn't say it again but that it's that, it's not it's not it's, your fault i i know but like i appreciate the sympathy yeah it's it's more of like i'm sorry that you have to go through this more or less it's i know it's not my my fault in particular um yeah, no, I, I, I'm the commissioner. <laughs> no, fuck that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, and it's again, I've never felt that type of discrimination before. So, and I don't think a lot of our listeners probably have either. It's mostly males. Um, not all of us. We have a pretty good percentage yeah. of female. Well, well you know, but. yeah. Welcome to disc golf. I mean, it is. <laughs> sorry, it's a sausage party. It's ninety three percent male by membership in the PDGA, and that's yeah. not a stat that's changed. I look at the stats every year in the annual demographic report, and regardless of what the women's committee is doing, it's seven percent female year after year after year. That's really interesting, actually. I thought that it would have uh, even out like at least a little bit um in our like explosion in of the sport that's so fucking weird i i can't account for it guys are just not dragging out <laughs> well i don't it. think i don't think that that's a successful method for recruitment um, I, <laughs> I think that that tends to breed resentment i've seen so many husbands or boyfriends bring their girlfriend or spouse and the retention rate is not great that's and true. There's a variety of reasons for that, and that's that's a whole nother show. Yeah, that's that's a completely uh, way too long of a tangent. <laughs> yeah, oh, but gosh. I mean, you know, talking about this policy and uh, how it's affected me, it's additionally it has literally just cost me money um, because in order to play in women's divisions at all, I had to go get a blood test and for people who aren't in the habit of having their blood tested, let's just walk through it because, you know, do you go to the blood testing place? What do you, how does that work? Right? Yeah. It, no it's a, exactly. It's a weird yeah. concept. So I had to like ring up my doctor on the phone and I'm like, uh, and she's a specialist in transgender women's health and I don't have to go to her, but I got real tired of, you know, my previous doctor calling me, sir. So I was like, fuck it. He's fired. Oh <laughs> <laughs> oh 
<laughs> yeah, that's like the quickest like turn. Oh, oh I'm out of this. Uh, <laughs> nice to meet you. Bye. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I don't. I don't care how good yeah. you are at helping me with my sinus infection. That's a deal breaker. Yeah. But uh, Jesus. So I had to, I had to call her up and you know and she's been treating transgender women and advising them in their health for like decades and decades. And it's not the only thing she does, but she has made a speciality of this. And I had to explain this to her. And even over the phone, I could hear her face palming. She's just like, really? I got to do what? And I was like, yeah, I know. It's terrible, will you? And she's like, yeah, I'll help you out. So, so I got to drive to see my doc. You know, I got to make an appointment. So it's an office visit. So mm -hmm. it's an office visit to a doctor. And it's not an annual checkup, mm -hmm. which means yeah. insurance. Not covered. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's not the free one, you know, and, 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 and even that insurance is kind of hard to get nowadays, but that's another story. Um, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah a couple yeah. of years ago, you used to be able to get checkups, remember those? Anyway, um, but it's not that. It's an office visit, so I've got to pay for the office visit. And at the office visit, you know, somebody's got to draw blood out of my arm and put it in a little vial, and that costs money. That's an upcharge. And then they courier it over to a lab. And the lab, you know, does what they do to measure the percentage of testosterone. And that's one of those ones where the lab mails a bill straight to my home. So, yeah. you know, you know, if you have anything more complicated than, you know, a twisted ankle, you're getting bills from three different directions. You, that's just medicine in America. You know that. So mm -hmm. I'll have the, I'll have the office visit and the blood draw bill coming from my doctor and the lab test bill coming from Quest Diagnostics and all told, it looks like I'm going to be out, but probably between two and three bills, uh, two three hundred dollars, to do this, um, and and this is not really medically necessary, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I and you know, finding for me a, a specialist wasn't easy. So it's an hour drive down and an hour drive back, and you know, gas ain't cheap anymore either. But yeah, so we're talking a couple. A couple the, hours of my the time. The convenience of it all, because you're literally you know, going to have a test for something yeah. that you don't produce. Yeah, literally so having the needle stuck in my arm and ow, that hurts and it's a creepy feeling. And then they draw the blood and they put it in a little vial and I put the bandaid on and I got the bandaid on my arm all day. Right. And I got and I got to pay a couple hundred bucks for this, and you know, it's it's a it's a raging imposition and. It's like, as, well, a, well as, a, as, as, a, as a transgender woman, you know, I'm already dealing with a lot of shit. Um, so it's like, you know, society wants me to be a certain way and they also kind of want to not see me. And they, you know, and I gotta, and society tries to police how we look and where we go to the bathroom and this and that. And it's and like, I'm you can given, win. <laughs> yeah. And I'm given and I'm given and I'm given and I'm given. And then the PDGA is like coming along and they're like, oh, hey, we want some of your blood and you're going to pay for the experience. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, you guys too? Really? Okay. So, yeah. Everyone so it's, wants a piece. Oh, they do. They do. So it's literally costing me money. And the new policy, I don't care about that paragraph at the end of the policy and that paragraph at the end of the announcement where it says, oh yeah, the PDGA is still fuzzy, warm, inclusive. The policy has had the effect of turbocharging the anti-transgender contingent because they got a little W and so you, give some, you give somebody a W and they're gonna feel good about it and they're gonna be like, what else can we win? And I have looked in on the spaces where like the, the anti-trans, no transgender and disc golf people hang out. Mm -hmm. And the day after the policy dropped, they were like, they had already stopped celebrating their W and they were looking forward to the next one. They're like, this policy, it's kind of a W, but it's like a little one. We want the big W where transgender women are completely banned from the sport. True story. Like, it's, a, it's a baby step. It is. It is. Uh, it's it's like that it's like that saying you know you let a camel stick its nose in your tent and then a minute later you got a camel in your tent yeah and same <laughs> thing and 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 to circle back to how i think the pdga isn't especially well run they managed to craft a policy that infuriated everyone 
because the people who support transgender players are obviously mad because this is discriminatory, but the people who oppose transgender players were also mad because it didn't go far enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, the PDGA board, they kind of dialed up a lose, lose. They pissed everyone off. Yeah. I so it's uh, good. Good job. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then on top of all of that, you know, they, it, what the effect has been, you know, personally to me is it, to me, it's damaged sort of the perception that disc golf is this inclusive welcoming space, um, at least online. Um, right. Just weird, true story in person, like at disc golf tournaments or even at like leagues and stuff, not one person has ever come up to me and said, hey, you shouldn't be here or you shouldn't be in this division. It's never happened. Um, it's only online, uh, mm -hmm. which speaks to the bravery of people, I think. And say everyone's stuff online. To, yep, yeah. love to hide behind a screen. Oh my God, so much so. But also, I, I have noticed that the anti-trans contingent, especially online, it's a handful of people because I've got a couple of online spaces where anybody can come and comment. And on both of them, after I got some notoriety and they started coming to me, it was not that many bands before everything was quiet again. Mm -hmm. And one of them actually came back to me and apologized a couple of weeks ago, which tripped me out. And they said that they'd been in a really bad place and this was sort of their jam. And this helped numb the pain, I guess. But they also told me, here's a list of all the aliases I've been using to screw you over. Whoa. <laughs> so I really think that the online opposition is a smaller group of people than what it seems like. Right. And that they're using alts. and. Mm -hmm. And also they are so turbocharged on this issue. And this is something uh, I wanna talk about just a little bit, that they are omnipresent. They are terminally online. They'll be on Twitter, then they'll go to Facebook, then they'll be in YouTube comments, then they'll be in YouTube live chat or DGPT stream. And they, mm -hmm. will, just, and they will just be shitting up the place. And a person looking at that would be thinking, look at all of this hate. It's on all these different platforms and it's, so, all these different people. Yeah, it looks like different hey, people. And right. And then you ban about 12 people and suddenly there's silence. It's like, oh. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the weirdest thing. That's the weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and depending on the platform, sometimes it's easier or harder to roll an alt, you know. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know it's, it's easier to make alts on, like, YouTube comments or... It's quite uh, literally like a middle school bully mindset. Oh, it is. It is. And they were completely given the green light by the PDGA to be hateful. Right. Yeah. Because they, even though the PDGA, you know, makes a, a modicum of effort at removing comments online or moderating chat, it's, it doesn't go far enough in my opinion. It's still... If, if you let it through, or if you give them a policy win, it just turbocharges them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If they, if it would have been, I, I was looking at the U.S. ultimate policy, I think, yeah. uh, where it's just, if you feel like you would like, or if you're more comfortable participating in female, do that. If, yeah, do that. You know. Oh, it's, it's like night and day. I, um, a, uh, uh, ultimate uh, podcast called share the air just had me on a couple of weeks ago and to i don't know much about ultimate so i did my research uh, i read up on ultimate as much as i could i watched some videos of some matches watched some top 10 videos of amazing plays uh okay read their lingo because their lingo is crazy and, oh, okay <laughs> and did all my research and then i started looking into like how they handle it and yeah it's like night and day like over on the ultimate side you know, they're like trying to figure out 
like, well, what do we what do we do with non-binary people? And they're and they're like attacking it in an intelligent and thoughtful way. They're, the issue, I mean, you know, they're they're right, coming not at the people. it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sorry if your pronouns are it. I didn't just attack you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I gotta be, I gotta make sure I'm, I'm not. A, oh, you're good. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything by accident. Right. Um, no, no. NBs you're valid. I support you. Um, but yeah, it's like over on the ultimate side, they're just like, uh, yeah, whatever division you are, you are. And, uh, and we're going to try and sort out the NB thing. And then I look over at disc golf and disc golf is like, there are men and there are women and then there are sometimes women. And I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's like a different era. It's, when, yeah. I was, when I was doing my ultimate research, it's like I was visiting the universe of Star Trek. I was just like, oh, this is, the, this is what the future looks like. This is so cool. Like, <laughs> now I got to go back to disc golf. Oh, that's, uh, that hurts my soul. <laughs> I I just want to, I wish they would have not done this. This just so fucked up. Oh right? my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. All uh. they yeah, all, all they had to do was not that. It would have been it would have been so easy. I mean, and let's, you know, the policy as it existed in the early part of 2022, it wasn't perfect. Let's make no mistake in that regard. But it wasn't this. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, um, Eric, if you want to go ahead, I, that was, that was amazing. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're doing so great. Oh, I, well, I've gotten a lot of practice over the last couple of weeks. Right. I, 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 <laughs> I've done more, bod, more podcasts and video shows in the last month than I had in the rest of my career. Oh my gosh. And I think that's because nobody else wants to talk about it. And yeah, legitimate, legitimate. I can see, I can see both sides of the equation. Um, on the one hand, if if you're sort of a lukewarm ally, but you kind of want to be for all people, and you want everybody to keep buying your discs, keep your mouth shut. I get it. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. You know, it's money. It's a lot. Yeah. A lot of money yeah, is the, motivation for so many people. Well, yeah, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but here we are. Um, oh, yeah, I'm I'm a filthy Sh lefty. Shuck a chord there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and and I get I get I get where some players, you know, if they're just sort of lukewarm on the issue, they don't want to make waves or they don't want to jeopardize a relationship or maybe this isn't something they think about a lot, so they're intimidated by the thought of accidentally coming down on the wrong side, or doing allyship wrong because they don't know how to do it yet and mm. so they're just sitting back and sort of letting it play out and i don't want to say i respect that but i get where that's coming from and mm -hmm. then and then i'm sure there are players who are anti i mean there are a few who are vocally anti and there are doubtlessly there are more who you know keep that to themselves and you know whether that is the Fear of being canceled, which is ridiculous. Um, that's hence the massive sarcasm quotes. You could, yep. yes. if you're listening to the if podcast, you're just listening, big quotes. Yeah, big I think I think you that. laid it on thick in your voice. If they yeah, could, I, I think, they, I think they got it. <laughs> but also, um, oh, where was I going with that? You know, there's this. I think there is some self awareness on the anti side that they may not win the fight. Uh, they may not win the war. You know, they might've got a W in this battle, but they may not be winning the war. And I have a feeling there are some people who are on the anti side who don't want to commit that on, you know, to a permanent recording, whether it's an online post, you know, a, a TikTok, a, an Insta post. But with, behind closed doors. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're but, making the votes and pushing. Yeah, pushing yeah. The, it's, yeah but, but they're a little bit concerned about how they're going to look in the rearview mirror of history. So sorry. I think there is some self-awareness of that. So, Which is terrible. A, it's, yeah, it but, makes them sneaky. Yeah, but, but as a result, it means that despite you know, the, the, the utter depravity of this new policy and how terrible it is. Aside from a couple of articles 
in the first week, it's mostly been deafening silence, you know, for like the last two months. Nobody mm -hmm. is coming out and having anything to say about it. You know, when anybody does any kind of an interview on any show or podcast, if they're not trans, they're not talking about it. And among, among the people of bad will, I'm okay with them holding their tongue. But among the people of goodwill, I confess to being a little bit disappointed in the moderate who remains silent. Not more outrage. Like that's that's kind of what I was thinking too. Uh, and that's actually why we ended up reaching out more towards um, because it, it actually I had a, I had a little random question that popped in my head if you want to, if you're ready. Do it. Did um did you have any uh, either behind closed doors or openly, did you have any support from any of the other uh, players or friends um, within uh, the tour? No. Um, among named players, um, anyone that you've seen on coverage or whatever, um, and it's been a long two months. So if one or two people did reach out to me, I am so sorry, I don't remember because I'm about to offend you. <laughs> I really don't remember any big gestures like that in the last couple of months. Um, however, I have sort of a self-curated, you know, group of people who I stay close to online. And because I curated that group, obviously they're, they're all in my corner on this. And mm -hmm. they've been absolutely wonderful. And nobody has, nobody has gone rogue or gone turncoat on me. So I got that going for me. That's good. I'm glad you have a, a good support, but that's beyond that. Uh, it's a slap from the PDGA. It's also kind of a slap from all of these people who have been presenting as caring, inclusive. Well, I think that gets back to uh, the path of least resistance though. Um, so true. doing, yeah, doing, doing nothing is so easy. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and it is really hard to take a principled stand when things that matter are actually on the line. Um, it's, it's easy to have principles when things are easy, because then you can just be like, I think this, and I think we should do this, but that's what everybody was already doing. So who cares? But then when, th when times get tough, and standing up for your principles means making some kind of sacrifice. That's when you find out how much somebody is willing to go to the wall for their principles. And for a lot of people, the, they seek the path of least resistance. And the answer to that question is not very far. And I don't have the answer for that. That's, that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. I am, and I am, I don't know if it's how I was raised or if it's the culture or the environment or just hard lessons I've learned over my life. I am principled to a fault and I, I will hurt myself with my principles. And <laughs> I mean, it's not to the point that it's a suicide pact, no, you know, but you know, mm -hmm. if, if, if the, if the ethical thing is, is to unalive myself, I will. I'll probably betray that principle. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a fool, but right. I, I do tend to bring a lot of fire down on myself by being unwilling to back down from a principle. But in this particular case, it's just that that you're a person. <laughs> like, like, that's just, ah, oh, fuck, I, I hate I'll, I'll say it for you. Fuck the PDGA. I neither endorse nor condemn this yes, statement. I, that, that, that definitely, <laughs> you, that's 100% that's my opinion. <laughs> I don't, I, 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 I can't say anything about that right now. Sorry. No, you're, yeah, you're so No okay. problem. Yeah, that's 100% uh, so, that's, that's just me. <laughs> So why don't you uh, just let I'm, us in the audience know what we can do to help other than being more vocal and uh, like more 
obviously supportive and stand by our principles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first off, um, this I'm going to say the boring thing first and the interesting thing second. Uh, the boring thing is vote in the PDGA Board of Directors election this coming July. Uh, the whole board doesn't rotate with every election. It's on a staggered system so that you don't have a whole class of rookies come in one year because right. although legitimately that might not be the worst thing in the world at this rate. Um, <laughs> but clean when you're, yeah, I mean, there are people who are already, you know, throwing their hat in the ring for the board of directors because uh, they want to influence this policy um, one way or the other. So when the board of, uh, when, the, when you get that email at the very beginning of July, if you're still even a member of the BDJ at this point, and if you're not, I respect that decision. Um, if you are in fact a member of the PDGA at the beginning of July, when you get that email about the board of directors, do vote. And I'm not sure who's up on the rotation for potentially being removed this year if they don't do well in the election. But I would like to point out that Jeff, Wilbur, David, and Nate are the four who voted to ban transgender players. And Conrad, Laura, and Leah voted against the ban. So let that be your guide. However, I think we reached out to Laura. I think Laura was one of the people that we reached out to. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I Sorry. I'm not. Uh, no, no, that, that's a good head. aside. And I'm not 100% sure what's going on at the board of directors. But aside from one Q&A article they did with Ulta World about three days after the policy was announced, they have been keeping a lid. Not on, a single thing has come no, out. Of them. No, their, their message control is eerily effective because other policies, other sorts of decisions, you know, members of the board, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have all kinds of things to say, well, I felt this way, I felt that way, you know, but on this one issue, they really seem to have got the message control on lock. And I don't know what's going on. I can only, I can only look at the lack of information and try to draw a conclusion from that. And golly, that's a little weird. Um, but that's that that's the easy thing and that's the boring thing vote you no know, but I mean, thank you uh that that's very very helpful oh well, thank you um and and fortunately you know the pdga hasn't been gerrymandered yet so you know your vote still counts um <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't give, even wait to give it time <laughs> what would that look like but uh <laughs> It, it's coming. It's coming. They'll, they'll you know, figure we, it out. <laughs> you know, you, you know how like local school board elections get really wacky with like these, these, these fringe candidates who are hyper focused on one thing and then they get voted on because who votes in school board elections? I mean, seriously. And then next thing you know, you know, your school board is doing insane things. And you're like, how did we get here? That's coming to the PDGA. We are going to have that kind of crazy school board candidate come into the PDGA trying to get on the board in this July's election. So read the statements from the candidates and vet them and understand who stands where. And if somebody's coming off as kind of a fringe one issue candidate, that you that might be a little bit of a red flag to you that they're not really interest, super interested in doing good governance. And they are super interested in doing this one thing. Yep, yeah, that's all they care about. Yeah, and maybe maybe don't let people who are like into that one thing onto the board because they're probably not going to be good at doing the rest of disc golf. And the sport's growing, and we need people who are good at all the disc golf, not just the one thing. So, okay, that's the easy thing, and that's the boring thing. Uh, the, now I'm going to tell you the hard thing, and I think the thing that's a little more interesting, and that is you got to moderate your communities, and you got to do that online and you got to do it offline and we'll do uh, online first if you have a space where you have the ban hammer or the ability to remove comments 
you're responsible for the tone of that space. You curate your community. And if you don't take an active role in doing that, then the community that results from your inaction is every bit as much your problem as if you had curated it deliberately. So like, you, you know, I, I don't know if either y'all game, but you know, you, you know, do at some yeah, point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you, you go online and you know, it's, it's not great. You know, the, the slurs are flying and the 14 year olds are doing what 14 year olds do. And, and yeah. it's terrible. And it's because the gaming companies aren't moderating their space. And mm -hmm. by not curating their community, they are in effect creating a different kind of community and it's not a good one. Same thing, if you are responsible for a space online, I don't care what anybody tells you about their freeze peach. You are, <laughs> you, you don't owe people a platform. If somebody comes into your community and they're stinking up the place and they're making it negative, get rid of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry. they can find their own community to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's the online half. But you also to have to do it offline in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're going to your local league and you're just hanging out and remember disc golf is 93% guys. So when you're hanging out with the bros and some, somebody drops the T slur, they drop the up slur or they drop the N bomb with the hard R. When they, when they drop a slur and chat locally, you got to speak up and you got to moderate your community in real life. You got to be mm -hmm. like, hey, I realize that there are no individuals of that particular persuasion standing around right now, and that you feel like it's okay to say that word because you feel like you're surrounded by like minded people because we all kind of look like you. But with me, that shit don't fly. Mm -hmm. Don't do that around me because we can't, if you keep that up, we can't be friends if that's the kind of person you're going to be, you know. Yeah, do strike first. Um, you know, I'll play, uh, you know, I'll play disc golf with you, but I'm not your bro and I'm not your friend if that's how you're going to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if you want to, if you want to keep it on the, the we're kind of strangers level, that's going to be the result of your actions. But if you drop that stuff and you don't say those words and you don't act that way and you don't act the fool around me, then we can be a little better friends. We can be a little friendlier. We can be chattier. I'll share my snacks with you. But, you know, you, and it's, it's not easy because if you're the first one to speak up, you know, you run the risk of being the downer. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but the downer is the person who dropped the slur first. Mm -hmm. They've already broken the piece by doing that. And they are testing the group to see if that's going to fly. And if nobody speaks up, then that's the community you get. So yeah, moderate your communities online, but moderate your communities in person too. Um, and and I, if you, I, I, sorry, just to add on to what you're saying, uh, yeah. like uh, uh, I feel like a lot of people would just be silent, you know, and at and the least resistance. That, yes, and and think that that's better than trying to not like causing friction or right um but it's it's just uh it's going back to that again too it's standing with your principles you mm -hmm. well and the people who don't want to make waves they're they're missing a very important point that is if the person who's making waves is the person who drops a slur in chat or who says something terrible like that they have they have created a bad situation and saying, hey, don't do that. It might feel like an escalation of the fight or a continuation of the fight, but really it's an attempt to stop the, it's an attempt to put the fire out. Right. And in the short term, that does make a little bit more noise. Right. But, but in the long term then? That, that, in the that long term, stopped. It's, it's been stopped and it's not gonna, hopefully not gonna happen again. Um, there's, there's two examples I can give of this. There's a, there was a famous Twitter thread where this guy's sitting in a crust punk bar and he, it's the kind of place where the bartender hates everybody. And he's just trying to drink his beer and the bartender is ignoring him and he's ignoring the bartender. <laughs> and this guy in a leather vest comes in and sits down at the bar and puts a couple dollars on the bar. And the bartender kind of looks at the guy and he's like, no, out, just get out. And the dude's like, 
what? I just sat down. I said, like, no, out. <laughs> and, the, and the dude leaves. And the guy, the author, says to the bartender, like, well, what, what was that about, man? And the bartender's like, you know, you, you couldn't see it from where you were sitting, but, you know, the, the, the guy's biker vest was all full of uh, Aryan patches or racist stuff. You know, and you, you know, he, was a, he was a Nazi biker. And he's like, and here's the situation. When you get your first Nazi biker in your bar, you got to kick him out. Because mm-hmm. if you just let him buy a beer, the next time he's going to come back with a buddy. And then he's going to come back with two buddies. Yep. And, then what's, and then your regulars are going to see these Nazi bikers hanging around and they're going to start drifting away. And one day you're going to wake up and realize you own a Nazi bar. <laughs> and at this point, you can't kick them out because they're the majority of the customers. And mm-hmm. if you try to kick them out, it's going to be a huge deal. So when, so you got to snuff that out like as soon as you see it. Early. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And to the person who's sitting there, you know, somebody comes in and sits down and they got the Nazi patches on and the bartender's like, no, get out. That feels like a confrontation, but that's nowhere near the confrontation that is going to come in the, in, the, in the future. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, there is this, uh, there's this really famous civil rights guy that some people might have heard of, um, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, letter from a Birmingham. Once, once or twice. Yeah. Letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, the, the paragraph that gets quoted the most is that he expresses his disappointment with, and you know, and this is civil rights, so with, with the white moderate who prefers the false peace of people just kind of suffering injustice quietly to the, the noise of people getting their, their, their due, to getting their just rights. And the moderates who prefer that kind of tranquility are, you know, they're, they're, they're prolonging the injustice. So, you know, don't it worse and they're, yeah, and they're making it worse. They're, you know, so yeah, don't, don't be that moderate and don't be that person who values the false piece of this live and let live, because if someone's dropping slurs, you know, that's not peace. You know, you have a bad situation already. And the thing of it is not every attribute that a person might be bigoted against is visible. So true. You know, you don't, you know, un, you don't know, you know, that your friend, you know, he, he might be a bi guy. And, you know, somebody starts dropping the F, the F slur in, in chat, you know, you know, the bi guy might just stop coming to your, your disc golf. And you don't know why. Right. Right. And because when people drift away like that, they don't fill out an exit survey. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they just go play ultimate or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta moderate your communities, you know, TLDR, you gotta moderate your communities. So vote, moderate, and stand by your principles, like in that yeah. moderation as well. That, that's... Yeah. yeah. And if you, and if you got a transgender friend, yeah, reach out to him on Facebook and say hi and tell him you're thinking about them. Yeah. That's, and, that's, that's and, and actually, Oh, and that's something everybody should do with everybody. There was just a study published the other day that's just like reaching out to like one old friend once a week just to check up and say, hey, how you doing? Like boosts both people's moods phenomenally for like a long time. So if there's somebody you haven't, if you've got an old friend you haven't said hi to in a while, just reach in out of the blue and just be like, hey, how's it going? Think about you. What's up with your life? And spend a minute. It's the dividends are going to be huge. And it's wholesome. Right. I feel like it was uh, very wholesome. Yeah, right. We we have a lot of the same uh uh concepts, I think. Uh also I, I wanted to just touch on there are so many parallels between like uh the civil rights movement and the current uh discrimination that trans uh people are facing. Um oh, it's, absolutely. It's the same playbook. It is, it is. I feel like they almost like <laughs> That's that's what they're doing. They're looking in the past. Mm-hmm. They're like, ah, how can we how can we screw these people over? Well, and the thing of it is, <sighs> and, and who the people are is immaterial. What it's really about is you have to come up with an outside group, invent a way that they are a threat to your women or children, and then be and you it's like you're not against 
that group, you're protecting your children or gotcha. you're protecting your women. Mm -hmm. um, do you go back to the you know post-Civil War all the way through the Jim Crow era, uh, it was racism and it was white men protecting their daughters and protecting their wives from the imagined threat of black men. And then you go to like uh, gay people and you look at like some old videos and propaganda videos really from like the fifties and sixties. Yeah. And you got to protect your children from the gay men and it's creating monsters. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, what's old is new again. Uh, that's the groomer thing that you've been hearing about. That's, that's back. Um, mm -hmm. And now with uh, transgender people, um, we have to protect women from, and I'm going to quote them because I don't think what they think. You know, you have to protect women from these invading men. Um, you know, so it's like, you know, transgender women want to go in women's bathrooms. So it's like these men are going into your bathroom or these right. men want to take away our daughter's scholarships for sports. Or, you know, we have to protect, we have to protect our wives and girlfriends from men because you know they're they're missing the point that transgender women are women so mm -hmm. so yeah it's always it's the they have to there's a group that they very patronizingly want to protect right ag against an outside group who is demonized and by framing it as we're defending such and such to the casual observer it appears that they're taking the moral high ground we're protecting how could right. protecting be a bad thing? Like, how, how could we be wrong? Oh. I wanted to just say thank you. I think this is like just being on a show like this can help dispel that thought of like, you're not a monster, you're a person. It's oh, thank you. Uh, and like, what, like and then that's like oh that's the most revolutionary thing i've ever said in my life <laughs> <laughs> smash the system trans women are women don't be scared of people it's just the mindset is just it, it's ridiculous to me it, it um but thank you again i think that you are just by doing this just so helpful to any uh person going through these type of things too so um i've got some I, feedback I on that yeah because i didn't you know like 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 i said at the beginning of the show i was sort of not publicly trans for right. a long time at the, it was at the beginning of 2022 the middle of january um when the political rhetoric was being dialed up with regards to transgender people in general and trans women in sports in particular right so after about two decades of comfortably being unrevealed i was like you know what let's just put a video out there so i put out this video on my channel uh also on my facebook feed some people are transgender and that's fine and i was like hey hey everybody i'm transgender and nothing's gonna change okay peace out it was a really short video yeah and mm -hmm. but just in this over the course of this year and seemingly out of nowhere like every couple of weeks i would have one, I would just have these incredible experiences where somebody would be like, hey, not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit into disc golf, play it with my family and all. And I have a non-binary child or a transgender sibling or my friends at my club back in this town are trans. And they, and I want to tell you that they're huge fans of yours and that what you're doing matters. And I was not expecting that to happen. And uh, at US Women's, uh, somebody um, came over to me and they're like, we have two transgender players back home and they know you're here and we're gonna run to the disc golf store across the street from the course and buy some MVP discs. And can you sign them and send them back? Cause they're huge fans. And I'm like, that's so yeah. nice. I was like, oh, okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. That's because you know, it's so, important. It's it really is. Yeah. Uh, apparent, apparently, there's not a lot of represent. Yeah, the, that 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 type of like um, the figures in in the mainstream that 
right they can apparently see that matters themselves and it's, that was that was kind of why why i came out i guess as trans was you know i mean even though i'd done it all 20 years ago i just came out anew just be like hey this is normal everybody it's cool right and i thought well maybe there's like one disc golfer out there somewhere who will see that and they'll be inspired and they'll feel a little better about themselves and that's good enough and then it's just like it you know it, the the good hits kept coming and i was just like wow this is this is startlingly effective and then, of course, the board did what they did in December, and suddenly it's like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to be out now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fuck. But, you know, well, it is uh, what it is, I guess, it, you know? It is. I, I, I signed up to be an inspiration. I didn't sign up to be a warrior. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. You're... <laughs> Take your time. Yeah, it's um. I just think you're great. I think you're doing great, and keep on doing what you're doing. Um, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can't not unless I quit. I know, but like, <laughs> I I just think you're uh, a great role model for the community. So. Oh well, thank thank you very much, and I I I think you're great for helping amplify my voice yeah um hopefully oh no everybody I, listens <laughs> well yeah you, you guys are doing great there's there's some shows i go on where it's like i'm way you know there's like different levels of discourse there's been some shows where i go on and i'm like all right let's start at the beginning this is what a transgender person is right <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's lay a little groundwork here, <laughs> and then there's other shows where I come in and I'm just like, you know, yeah, intersectional femininity. You know, you got to worry about, you know, your overlapping you know, degrees of privilege, and, it, and and the hosts are like, yeah, we're on. It's like okay, and it's like, you know, no, you, I, I'm, no, I, I get the vibe from y'all that this is the show where I can just come in, like, you know talking about the 2000 or 3000 level courses and we can skip the 101 <laughs> yeah you you got it <laughs> and and hopefully uh you know if you don't know what a transgender you know what i mean like, go google it google it do your own fucking research yeah God. i mean um, i'll i'm willing to help out when i've got the time you know i feel like i feel like if there's a question that you know people need answered and it's you know any of their business and and yeah and if it's any of their friggin business you know i absolutely bring it to me, you know <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah if you're, if you're just thinking about transgender people in general yeah just go online and right. and legitimately you know yeah you know, and you know vet your sources you know if somebody seems really mad about it you know they might not they might not be your best source and that goes on either way you know um, and I don't want to do both sides are bad. I'm just saying there's a lot of rage bait out there on the internet. You know, really if, so is. if somebody's trying to engage your amygdala and get you mad, they might not be your friend. You so know, sorry. they might be short circuiting the thinky parts of your brain and trying to get into the reaction parts of your brain. That, that lizard brain we all have deep oh down. My God. Oh yeah. And that's like a crack hit, you know, um, that's, that's how engagement works online is the stuff that makes you mad keeps you coming back for more and the and, algorithm pushes it <laughs> oh absolutely it does i don't i don't know the fix for that because i'm not an online smarty pants but <laughs> but i can i can see it happening right oh yeah oh. Oh, okay well that was amazing i got a i got a great question yeah okay outside of this policy change what is your worst or most memorable oh no moment on tour in the spirit of the show okay yeah we, we have we to know. Do oh no um <laughs> yeah right. I, I was saying oh fuck every yeah. time i hit a tree and i had to switch it up so we switch it to oh no okay that's cool <laughs> i'm gonna cheat i got two um the All first right, oh, okay. the first and the first oh no is tangentially related to the the policy change so sorry um it's okay and that is <laughs> after the election of the board 
and the two particularly anti-transgender one issue candidates did not make the vote and they did not get on the board. I was like, okay, cool. Let's, let's settle down and get back to disc golf. And then the board of directors pushes out this survey on the issue to all the players. And I was like, oh no. Oh yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's like, they want another swing at it. They want another ticket. Yeah. You know, it's like, they yeah. didn't get, they didn't get the board stacked. So now they're going to put a survey out there. And I don't know if you know this, but surveys about minorities aren't a good way to make policy for minorities because by definition, there are fewer people in a minority. Mm -hmm. So if you have a vote, they don't get as many win. votes. Like what, what did you think was going to happen? You know, it's like if you got, a, if you got 19 wolves and one sheep and you put out a survey about who's for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you can get two. Okay, so that was my, that was my first one. No, as soon as that, mm -hmm. that, 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 I saw that poll come out, I was just like, oh no, oh, they're yeah. done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, yeah, because oh yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, like, let's look at uh, interracial marriage. Uh, Loving mm -hmm. versus Virginia Supreme Court case settled that on the good side in what 1968, 1969. Actual public approval in polls of interracial marriage didn't creep above the 50% mark until the mid 1980s, you know, wow. a couple decades mm -hmm. later. So, yeah. so what would happen if Loving versus Virginia had been a poll? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so when they put out that poll, I was like, oh no. Um, the other oh no moment, and this is a, this is on the course. Mm -hmm. I was my first tournament playing as a pro. Um, and I was so, trying to, and I was, it was a two rounder C tier one day, about three holes to play in the final round. And I'm only down by like one throw. I'm like so close to taking down my very first open win at my very right. first open tournament. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it's against a local pro who's pretty good. And I'd sort of looked at her as like my role model, but mm -hmm. also on the way up, you know, kind of paint targets on the backs of increasingly better and better players right you want to like yeah you like improve one day i'm going to take her down her. and then right. one day i'm going to catch her and one day I'm gonna... yeah so she was to be the first and i was only one throw off and um it's late autumn it's like november in missouri so the leaves are off the trees and they had mm -hmm. been for a couple of months and they were they were good and crusty and brown and this was 2015 so i was still throwing mixed bag it wasn't sponsored yet. I'd only been thrown for nine months. Um, I'm not that much of a prodigy. And <laughs> I had this West Side Discs Renegade, Air Renegade. Okay. And if you know the trilogy plastics, and this is before halos and bursts and swirls and chameleons and shimmers, and oh my God, yeah. there's so many plastics now. Oh, you know, nice. this is back when you had Opto Lucid and like Prime. No, no, yeah. Prime didn't exist yet. Prime didn't Classic, exist yet. Classic, I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was the there was the the opaque stuff and the clear stuff. Yep. And then the baseline <laughs> the base stuff, stuff for the powder, yep. powders. Yeah. And the names were different depending on which company. But mm -hmm. this is back when the West Side Discs. They were all these weird earth tones. They did not mm -hmm. have any bright colors. There was no fire engine safety green or hunter blaze orange. So I had this orange disc that was kind of a burnt red, orange autumn leaf color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with three holes to play, I throw it on this massive blind downhill bomb where all the leaves collect at the bottom of the hill. Oh, gone forever. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler. And, <laughs> yeah, spoiler. Oh, yeah, spoiler. Oh, ruined it. And you know, we, we stomped through those leaves for three minutes looking for that stupid disc. So, and I was like, oh no, oh no. no. And the thing of it was, I, with what I knew about uh, who I was playing with, I had a reasonable chance of getting the other strokes back on the final two holes. So mm -hmm. I was just like, I was just like, get off this hole and yeah. we'll try to do good on 17 and 18. Yeah. And, and I had a lost disc penalty. And yeah. it was a small enough field that like the payout was only for first. Um, mm -hmm. oh, and nice. it was like $225, which, 
and I was like, that that was a two hundred and twenty five dollar loose uh, air renegade. And oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that that's my encore sound now. Damn, we did you ever find it? Did you ever no. get it back? No, oh, okay. no, no, it's wow. gone. Oh man. Oh, it's the course. You would now. think it would have been found at some place, at some point. <laughs> I wonder if somebody found it and has it now and has no idea that story that's involved with it. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Well, if you're that person, enjoy <laughs> the disc. <laughs> yeah, it was uh it was it was some OG plastic. That's that was way back when they were ink jetting the weight with that little dot matrix printer on the mm-hmm. backs of the discs. So that's those are valuable now so that 225 twenty-five dollar renegade is probably worth a couple of bucks now yeah. <laughs> even more so with the story right yeah. um so now what mm-hmm. if you would have been sponsored by mvp what have you what would you have thrown if, looking back now what would have been your disc of choice oh for that well, downhill I'm, shot oh my god well i'd only been thrown for nine months so i was stupid i didn't know what i was doing um (laughs) let's see given what i know about mvp oh i i probably would have done something really dumb like try to throw you know like a neutron amp straight down this tunnel shot and because i was a noodle arm it would have faded out and gone in the leaves and i would have lost it too (laughs) so same same result yeah pretty much (laughs) well i've i've played it i've I've played that course since then. Uh, now I fire a neutron trace down the hill as hard as I can. It, it, it's perfect. All but, right. Yeah, but that that does not help me back in 2015. Nope. No. Nope. Can't take that back. Oh, shit. Um, was there anything that we kind of missed in the in any of the policy talk or or oh, anything wow. that you want to make sure we touch on before we before we kind of continue? Oh. I'm going to wake up at about 2 a.m. and realize the yeah, answer to that is, yeah, sure. it, happens. it happens a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll just have to have you back on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Legit. I can't, I can't really think of anything. Um, I feel like we've covered everything I know and right. we have avoided straying into the area of speculation, which is good because it's important not to say things that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wait. Oh. Yes, that does remind me. Um, thinking about like the social environment at disc golf, um, like there'll be times where I, you get like a bad vibe off a player. And it used to be I'd get a bad vibe off a player and I'd be like, eh, that's them. I don't know what's going on with their life. You know, give mm-hmm. them the benefit of the doubt. Right. But ever since, ever since, transgender women became controversial it's so hard to avoid thinking negative things when somebody is like giving me side eye Mm. or if there's like a group of players that are all hanging out and you know and i'm going past you know you know going to the practice basket or going to load my car coming or going and they all get real quiet and they all just sort of swivel their heads in unison as I go by. Rubber neck. And then over my shoulder, I hear the conversation resume. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a weird feeling. And, yeah. and that's only been ramped up like in the last year or so. I mm-hmm. get I get the weird feeling that I'm a topic of conversation sometimes. And it's really unfortunate because it makes things awkward. So it's, it's uh, it goes back was, to that they gave the hate a win so yeah, yeah. they can now conversate about hate and yeah i was i was get yeah i was getting a little bit of that vibe hanging around in the masters pools at like uh this most recent pro worlds like you know there were people who were genuinely happy to see me and they'd you know run over like hey you know of a long time you know whatever mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but that whole you know that you know that's like the the echo in the bunny man song you know people are strange when you're a stranger mm-hmm. and it's like i'm i'm feeling a little bit more like a stranger here now and i'm actually deeply concerned about masters worlds and flagstaff this coming july because it's in the middle of july and the election season the election season for this board election 
runs July 1st to July 31st. So whatever no. the whatever the rhetoric is going to be, uh -huh. it's going to be ramped up all through the month of July. And I'm going to yeah. be hanging around with a bunch of masters and grandmasters and old mm -hmm. grandmasters, players. And, and um, I hate to say this, but the truth is, this is an issue that, that is divided on generational lines. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons I kind of like being on the DGPT and being playing in tour events is the kids are all right. They really yeah. are. Um, <laughs> the environment is so fun. good. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm 52 years old, so I'm a grandma compared to them. But, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but, but the kids are all right. But, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I, uh, the people my age and the people older than my age, I don't get the best vibes. I'm feeling a little bit more like a stranger among people with whom I used to be a peer. Right. And it's just yeah. fortunate. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, you know, and I think that's just part of the policy change and part of the culture war. Mm -hmm. And that's yep. one, and this is one of those circumstances where you got to moderate your, your in the, <laughs> you got to moderate your community and where you got to reach out to people. If, you know, if you know somebody that's possibly affected by this, you know, let them know that you think they're all right. Because when somebody is just silent, I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, or, or, or are you thinking that they're the silence? is a, their statement like sil well, silence can uh. it can communicate a lot but i try i try so hard not to act like i know things that i don't know yeah assumptions and, are so difficult and you know so this leads me by default to give people probably too much benefit of the doubt but that's a sacrifice i'm willing to make in order to avoid not giving someone the benefit of the doubt you're, you're strong enough to handle it i think uh, it has you, its moments but i'll you, try you project <laughs> the image of of being able to handle it that, that that's all i meant oh, oh, well thank you yeah oh all right that was good <laughs> sorry i keep saying that but like i I've, i'm I, I've been watch. I've watched your show like for like the last twenty episodes. When do we get to the fart jokes? <laughs> <laughs> Those come on accident. <laughs> I feel like we forgot to do the fart jokes. <laughs> oh, I don't think I. I don't think I ate the right uh, right food for dinner and lunch today to right. produce those. <laughs> Speaking of, do you have a favorite Gosh. snack on the course? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I load up my cart or my bag with grandma candy. Um, I get, those, right. little, I get those, those individual toffees or the coffee candies or those red uh -huh. and white swirly Starburst mints. Oh, okay. Or, yeah, man. or you know, any kind of candy that comes in little individual wrappers. Like if there's something like that in the hotel lobby, I'll grab a bunch of them and throw them in my bag. Yeah. Um, you know, when I go to the bank, I grab a bunch of the lollipops. You know, oh, just, yeah. They're free. Yeah, yeah. And I don't care how I don't care what the mood is in a card. You know, sometimes, you know, even with touring pros, you know, there, there's a moment where everybody's just kind of feeling everybody out and it's it's a little bit game facey. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, this player's got her earbuds in and this player is just way more into her caddy than the rest of the group. And, you know, and, you know, maybe it's maybe it's uh, the mix of players is not a group that's super accustomed to playing together. I bust out that grandma candy around hole three, everything lightens up. It's like everybody's mm -hmm. everybody's picking through it. They're like, oh, I want this one. I want that one. And <laughs> it's it's an it's an awesome icebreaker and a mood breaker because everybody's gangsta till the grandma candy comes out. Mm -hmm. And and then they're just like, oh yeah. It's my new favorite quote. Everyone's gangsta till the grandma candy comes out. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a good one. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. And, um, <laughs> and seriously yeah. um it's it's a, it's a human bonding it. thing you know share yeah. food for sure yeah and it, it's the smallest thing and yeah. it's it, suddenly you have a friend <laughs> yeah share your yeah share your treats yeah mm -hmm. 
Yeah. My other yeah. favorite snack is whatever the, the tournament provided. I walk up to yep. like check in or the registration table, whatever they got sitting in that little bowl. That's my favorite snack. <laughs> what is that? Fig bar? Yeah, I love fig bars. Banana? Oh man, bananas are my jam. <laughs> Fiber one bar? I'll have just one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't eat two fiber one bars. That's all I'm saying. Nope. Yeah, that'll be that could cause issues for your round. That could be a whole nother oh no. <laughs> um, well, I think that's all kind of all the questions we have. Kyle, did you um anything you want to touch on? I think that we got to everything. Can I yeah, do some? I just I, I was just expecting most people to just ignore my message to even like uh, talk with me. So I 100% appreciate you coming on the show. 100% appreciate you being such a wonderful um, uh, person within not only just as a trans community, but as a uh, female professional uh, sports person. Um, I think that you're doing great and I really do appreciate you coming on. I think that it'll be really helpful for, um, other people and, um, yeah, I just, thank you. Well, thanks for taking a chance on me. Uh, it's not easy going out on a limb like that. So I super appreciate it. Absolutely. You avoided the path of least resistance. Yeah. The whole thing didn't sit well with me. So I was like, I have to do something. Let's do something. Um, rock on can i do um, some shout outs for social media links 100 percent. let us know where uh the people can follow you all right um even though nobody should be on facebook and that that includes me and you um i am on facebook (laughs) facebook facebook.com slash big smooth dg all one word b-i-g-s-m-o-o-t-h-d-g um that's long story and (laughs) and i throw up a video uh, every couple of weeks on youtube.com slash Nova Polite, my first name and my last name all run together. Or if you want to do the at thing on YouTube, it's just at Nova Polite. Um, and if you want to figure out how to spell my name, look in the show notes. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, that was great. Um, uh, yeah, follow there. And Eric, get us on out of here. Thank you so much again, Nova, for taking time out of your day to hang out with us. We very much appreciated it. It was awesome meeting you. And uh, we will definitely be looking out to to get you on again soon, hopefully under better circumstances. Ah, It's been a delight. Maybe maybe I'll come back if I can successfully get the 3X. We'll see how it goes. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. I got some uh, tough competition coming this year. It's going to be hard. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you're up for it. <laughs> right. Oh, and I wish you nothing but the best this year too. Any any tournaments yeah. that you're doing, all the all the all the sports stuff. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not quitting. I'm just uh, doing a lot more A tiers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, and uh, I'll, I'm gonna try and hit some of Callie McMoran's uh, Disc Golf Masters Tour. That's an amazing thing she stepped up to do. So go, Callie. You're awesome. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. I didn't. I didn't yeah, DGMT. Really heard about it. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. She took me by surprise, just came out of nowhere with this full fledged tour, just ready to go. Boom. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Now, another thing to follow and watch, watch for. Thank you. Yeah. You betcha. Um, well, we will uh, see everyone next week. Yeah. Oh, Kyle had something. No, you're good. It's all good. Okay. All right. We'll catch you on the flip side, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>